to start by looking at the obvious. God is love, and I'm so grateful that he is. But one of the attributes of, of love is kindness, kind. And I'm so grateful for the people that are famous in my life because they were kind to me. Uh, they, they offered me hope when I had none. They opened doors for me. They encouraged me. They, people that made a difference in my life. Uh, one of the ladies was called Lila Ruffier. She was a cousin of my dad's. And she phoned my mom and dad when I was a little boy, and she asked if she could come and pick me and my brother up and take us to Sunday school, because my parents were not churchgoers. And she came on a little Siam de Tela car, and this was in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And she drove up to our house, and she took us to Sunday school. And on the way back, she'd buy us ice cream. So we really enjoyed it. And you wonder, what difference did those few trips make? Well, I am a pastor today who loves the local church. Kindness is a power that's often overlooked in our world. And so I want to talk about that, the power of one. How that lady, Lila Ruffier, she was just one person, and all she did was think and do something that any one of us could do, and yet, in many ways, it left a mark on my life. Can you think of people in your life that have left a mark on yours? Maybe it was a teacher, maybe a mother, a father, maybe a friend, or somebody or somebody you worked with who spoke into your life, and, and just because they, they were kind to you at a moment when you needed the kindness, your life has been different ever since. One person can make a difference. Now, on the internet, we have influencers, and influencers have followings. And one lady called Amanda Surnam, she has 27.4 million followers. And she influences all these people, but not with kindness. They're trying to buy products, and, and, uh, and she gets millions of dollars for doing it. So one person can influence the world. A lady called Margaret Mead, who's an anthropologist, was doing a lecture at a big university, and she was asked this question, what is the first sign of civilization? What is the first sign of civilization in a culture? And she showed this slide of a skeleton, and she said that skeleton was discovered, it's 15,000 years old, and the femur bone was totally broken but it is totally healed. That is a sign of a culture. And the reason is because that person could not have survived if someone hadn't helped them. They had to gather and hunt, and if somebody hadn't been kind and compassionate, that man would have died. It's a first sign, it's kindness. Kindness shows that we're followers of Jesus. Two. Look what it says in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate. 250 times in Scripture, it talks about being kind. Being kind. And there's nothing more exciting than bringing a smile to someone's face. And you know what? When you put a smile on someone's face, you get one on yours. When we make a difference when we know that we did something good, we go to sleep at night and we think we're so grateful that we did that. Do something for someone that can't ever pay you back. We don't do it to get something, we do it to give something. I like the story of a parrot and that this lady bought, it's a not true story, but it's funny, I think. <laughs> and so this lady buys this parrot and, and the parrot looks kind of depressed. So she goes to the store and says, what can I do to cheer the parrot up? So they sold her a mirror. Parrots like to look in the mirror. Didn't make any difference. He goes back to the pet store. Can't, the mirror didn't work. What? So they gave her, she bought, a ladder. And the, the parrot could go up and down the ladder. But the parrot was still morose. So he goes back and said, what? And they, they sell her a, a little bell. And finally, the parrot is on the bottom of the cage. And the parrot talks for the first time and says, don't they sell food in that store? And sometimes, you know, we get all caught up in our Christianity. We need to do this and that and the other. And we forget the basics of food. And kindness is one of the basics because it's an expression of the love of God. 
And the greatest story in scripture, in fact, anywhere, I think, is the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus told this story in Luke chapter 10. And the story of the Good Samaritan starts with a lawyer. And the lawyer challenges Jesus. He's a theologian, a lawyer of the, of the word of God. And he says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what does the scripture say? And so the man said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, every part of your being, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says, good, you've answered well. Do that and you will live. And the guy trying to justify himself because he didn't love everybody, because he had biases and prejudices, obviously, said, and who is my neighbor, huh? You see, who is my neighbor? And so that's when Jesus tells this amazing parable. And the story you might remember is of a, a man, a Jewish man, who's just going about his business. And as he's going down a road, he gets attacked by robbers, by criminals who beat him up and they steal everything from him. You see, the criminals saw that man as, as a, a, that victim as an opportunity to rob to exploit him, to take as much away from him as they could. And they didn't care about him. There was no kindness in their heart. They just wanted to rob, and they beat him up, and they didn't care how much they hurt him. The world has lots of people like that. They just want to exploit others. They see them as an opportunity to take advantage and take what they've got. You see, this story could be in the newspaper today, couldn't it? And then... The poor man is there bleeding, and along comes a priest. He's a religious guy, as priests are. And the priest sees the guy, but instead of seeing him as an opportunity to rob him, he sees him as, as a nuisance, as an inconvenience. And he doesn't want to. He's busy. He's going to church or coming from church because Jericho and Jerusalem, the priest used to do that walk to go to the temple. And, and he crosses over and just ignores him because he's a nuisance, an inconvenience. And then along comes a Levite who's, who probably saw the man too, but he saw the priest and the priest didn't help him. So he thinks if the priest who's my leader didn't help him, I don't need to help him either. And he doesn't get involved at all. And then of course, along comes a Samaritan. And what makes this story really significant is that the Samaritan was a different race hated by the Jews. He, he, he is actually the immigrant in the story. And, and the immigrant, the foreigner, the outcast, is a hero. And he's the guy who takes, sees a man, and, and he was probably on his way to work, or maybe he was going to a business transaction. We don't know. He had a donkey. Maybe he was a merchant. And, but he... He was busy too, but he sees the guy and he sees him with different eyes. He doesn't see them as someone to take advantage of, like the criminals, or to somebody to ignore because they're a nuisance or an inconvenience, like the religious people. He sees them as a fellow human being who's broken and needs help. And here's where kindness comes in. And he goes and he helps the man up, and he puts him on his own donkey, and then he looks after him, he bandages him, takes him to an inn, he pays for the inn to look after him, and that's amazing. And he says, I'll come back later and I'll pay anything extra that, that he costs. What a difference between the criminal and the religious people and the Samaritan. And so then Jesus says to the to guy, uh, who, who is the one who treats the person as a neighbor? And so he said, the one who had mercy on him, the one who showed kindness, the one who did something. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. You see, the problem with the lawyer type, the theologian, is that often the easiest way to not do something is study it. Well, I don't know about, enough about it. Let's study it a little longer. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You just go and do it. Go and do likewise. This story is a perfect example of Jesus, isn't it? How the world is broken by sin and people are hurting one another instead of loving one another and doing horrible things. And Jesus comes, one person, Jesus, comes, born of a virgin to live a sinless life, to, to show kindness and mercy and healing and love, and then die on a cross and rise again. And, and 
He came like the Samaritan to take broken people like me and broken people like you and broken people like you and bring us together. And then once we have found peace with him and once our lives are better than they were, then we can go and do likewise. Now, I'd like to talk about, about this, but this I saw on the internet and I thought it was interesting. Here's somebody drowning. And so what does everybody do? They take out their cell phone and take a picture. Isn't that true? We don't want to get involved. We just want to record the event. Crazy world. So I'd like to talk about windows, walls, and doors. Is that okay with you? Windows, walls, and doors. Number one is windows. You see, the story starts like this. Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell on the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. The Samaritan looked and saw the man. I ask you, as you look out the window of your house, as you look out the window of your home, as you looked out the window of our church, what do you see in our surrounding areas? Who are the people that are in need? What is it that I could do that would make a difference? A man by the name of James Lee, James Lee, was in the newspaper in the United States quite some time ago. He had shot himself, taken a gun, put it in his mouth in a telephone booth, because it was a while ago, obviously, telephone booth, and uh, shot himself. And when they went to discover the body, they found in the pocket there was a picture done with crayons by a little girl, and, and the name Shirley Lee had been written by, obviously an adult, underneath it. And it was a piece of paper that had been folded and folded and folded and folded, and it was in the pocket. And in the other pocket was his suicide note. And it said, please bury me with the picture done by my daughter. And then they looked at the, found out that, that this man, his wife had died just after the little girl, Shirley Lee, was, was born. And just five months before, there'd been a fire, and Shirley Lee, his little daughter, had died in that fire. And the man, for the last five months, was despondent. He felt that he didn't want to live in this indifferent world, in this alone world, lonely, lonely world. And he thought the only way out was to kill himself. And in the note, he left all his money to the local church. And he asked that they put a plaque on a wall. They would say, you know, in memory of Shirley Lee. So the people maybe 10 years from now or 20 years from now will look at that little plaque and say, somebody must have loved that girl very, very much. There are James Lees all over the world. They don't tell us that they're going through struggles. They don't tell us that they're lonely. But, you know, kindness could have saved his life. To be kind is a power. So who do I see? And the second is the walls. The walls is what is it that stops me from doing this? The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. He saw him as an inconvenience, as, as a nuisance. And it said, so too the Levite, the religious people. He, he came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. I don't know what went through his mind. Maybe I don't have the skills for that. Maybe I'm busy, I'm in a hurry, I've got commitments. Maybe I've spent all my time in the temple, I, I've done my duty, I don't need to get involved. Maybe somebody else will do it. Unfortunately, the Samaritan did. And then that, the third is the doors, the Samaritan. The Samaritan, he traveled, came to where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Wonderful story, the Samaritan. I love the story happened in Belgium years ago where this very incredibly talented man who worked with glass and made stained glass windows for churches, but he was a perfectionist and people didn't like working with him, so he couldn't find work. And so he found all the broken pieces of glass that other glass workers were discarding pieces that were useless to them. And he took all the pieces that he couldn't afford to buy, all the broken pieces, and he made out of that a beautiful stained glass for a church of the Good Samaritan. And that's what God does. He takes broken people like me and like you, 
And then he puts us together and makes us into something beautiful, something wonderful, something special that the world can see. And his light shines through the stained glass, just as God wants to shine through your life and your life and your life and your life. And kindness is how he does it. And if you're here listening to me and you've never committed your life to Christ, you've never said, God, I need you in my life, you've just held him at at arm's length, this morning you can pray or today or whatever time you're watching this, you can pray right where you are, say, God, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I want to accept your kindness, your love, you the Savior. I'm on the road and I'm broken. I need you, Jesus. And as you cry out to him here in the pew, watching at home, as you cry out to Jesus, he will listen, he will answer, and you can start to read your Bible and pray and start looking for this church online and begin your life following Jesus. So what are the lessons that we learn? What are the practical things that we learn from the story that I can apply in my life so that I can bring smiles to other people? Number one, because I care, uh, I will be willing and available. That was the difference between the Levites and the criminals. The criminals saw them as, as somebody to take advantage of. The Levites saw them as an inconvenience, but the Samaritans saw them as an opportunity and he was available. I grew up in South America. My dad taught me that beggars, and there are lots of beggars in South America, as there are in other countries too, they're often cripples or they whatever. And he said, we don't give to beggars. And they would often be outside churches. We don't give to beggars because many of them were cheats. They would cripple the kids and horrible stories. And so I'm, I never gave to beggars because my dad said, you don't do that. No, don't give to anyone in need. You just don't. And so I didn't, unfortunately. Now, here's the point. That Samaritan did not make the decision to help the man in need on that road. Mm -mm. He made that decision years earlier in a meeting just like this one, probably, where he said, if I ever get into that situation, I will be the Samaritan. I will be the person who shows kindness. And so I pray that this morning, you and I will say, God, may when the opportunity comes, I want to decide now that I will be the one that will be available. I'll be looking for the opportunities. I have a friend, Pastor Mark is a very good friend of mine, but I have another friend who, who lives out in eastern Ontario. And he had a neighbor whose widow husband died, left a big piece of land, and she had trouble mowing the lawn. He saw her trying to mow the lawn. The thing wasn't working. And he was driving past, and he pulled in to her driveway, got out, because he knows something about mechanics, and he said, I look after that, picked the lawn mower up, put it in his car, took it to his little shop, and fixed it, and took it back. And the lady was excited. She started going back to church, all because he saw a need. What is the need that I can see? I want to be willing and available. The second one is, uh, because I care, I will watch for opportunities. Okay, it says, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I'm going to, I'm going to watch for opportunities, opportunities around me. What is it that I could do for somebody else? What is it that I could do? I traveled across Canada many times, many, many times, speaking at conferences and conventions, and I did a series of lectures for leadership across the country, coast to coast, from Newfoundland to Victoria. And I had a friend with me called Dr. Sam Ousu, and Sam is from Ghana, and he's a very good friend of mine, and the two of us would, would teach. And we were in Montreal. We just finished teaching, we were tired, we would get to the airport check-in, we're in looking for our gate, and we're looking for something to eat, I'm looking for something to eat, and my friend sees a lady, African lady, with, with suitcases, probably a brand new immigrant, with little kids, and she's not handling the suitcases, and I'm looking for the restaurant, and he sees the lady, and he sees the need, he immediately 
says, David, get my bag. And he comes over and he picks up the ladies' bags. And I walk behind them and we walk for miles, it seems, to the gate where she was going to get on a plane. And I felt so ashamed that I didn't even think of helping. I didn't even see the opportunity that he did. God help me to see the opportunities in my life. Jesus had divine appointments. I need them too. Because I care, I will develop a kind heart. He took pity on him, and when he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. I just remember that Jesus wept. You all know that verse, right? It's the shortest one in the Bible. You know it, Jesus wept. <laughs> and it, Jesus wept. He saw that his friend Lazarus had died, and he was overtaken by grief. I need to care. I have friends that are pastors, and I eat with them, with, have lunch with them, and have done. And I, there are a number of them who talk about the people that came to Christ that week. And they say, you know, this guy came to Christ, and I had the privilege. And as they're talking to me, tears start streaming down their face because this is not just a, a sales pitch. This is somebody whose life has been changed for all of eternity through Jesus Christ. Wow. And so we need to develop a heart like that, a heart that gratitude does that. I'm grateful that that was once me, and somebody helped me, and now it's my turn to help them. God, change my heart. Help me this morning to, to want to get involved. And I, next is, I, because I care, I want to get involved. And he put the man on his own donkey and took him to the inn to, look, to, to, sorry, to take care of him. He put him on his own donkey. He got involved. There's a lady called M Mel... Robbins, and she wrote a book that's a bestseller. It's a business bestseller, and it's called The Five-Minute Principle. And all the book is, and she, listen, she sold millions of copies. She does big business conferences in stadiums all over the world, makes a ton of money. And all this book is about is this, that when you see an opportunity to do something that you know is good and it would do, be good for you, Decide to do it in the first five seconds. Because if you stop about and don't do it in the first five seconds, your brain will talk you out of it. Doesn't that sound right? Well, she's made millions of dollars doing this. Now, let me warn you that sometimes helping people, they're not grateful. But we don't do it for them, do we? We do it because we're followers of Jesus, right? There was this guy who went to a nursing home and he was helping, just volunteering in the nursing home. And one of the gentlemen who, who had Parkinson's and couldn't write anymore asked if he could dictate a card to send to his daughter. So this volunteer writes, the guy dictates what he wants the daughter to see. And when he finishes, the guy says, oh, and put a PS at the bottom, PS. I'm sorry for my terrible handwriting. Written by the other guy. Okay, I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> but not always will people be grateful to you. And because I care, number five, I will use all our gifts. You see, the, there's only so much that the, the, that the Samaritan could do. He bandaged. He obviously knew how to do that. He put him on the donkey. He took him to the inn. He took him to the inn because... He didn't have the facilities to look after him long term. He didn't have the gift of hospitality, which clearly the, the, the innkeeper had. And you have, we have all got different gifts, you and I. We all have different gifts, don't we? And, and Jesus talked about that in a parable in Matthew 25, how he's given some people more gifts than others, right? You probably have 10 times more gifts than I have. But we all have gifts, but they're not our gifts. They were given to us on loan. That's what the parable in Matthew 25 is about. They were given to us on loan. And one day, we will have to give account for all those gifts and how we use them. I, I heard just, the other, just this week of, of this grandmother whose grandson is coming with her, his new girlfriend, in fact, no, in fact, a new wife to visit her. And she's in a nursing home. It isn't a nursing home. It's a senior's apartment. 
And so the grandma sends an, an email, and she says to the, to the grandson, I'm looking forward to seeing you and your, and your new wife. Uh, when you come to, to, to the apartment building, uh, you need to, to press the button with your elbow. With your elbow, press the button, and I'll answer and let you in the door. And then you go to the elevator, and I want you to, with the elbow, touch the elevator button, and it'll call the elevator. And I'm in 15T, so get on the elevator, and with your elbow, press 15, and then come on up, and I'll be waiting for you. And the grandson asks, says back, Grandma, why is it that you want me to use the elbow to press all the buttons? And she said, what? You're going to come empty-handed? <laughs> and you know, when we get to heaven, I don't want to be empty-handed. I want to get to heaven having made a difference. Yes, I'm only one. Yes, I don't have all the gifts and all the abilities. I'm just me, just like you are you. But I can do something. And it's those things that we do and the difference we make that are going to be the rewards that we get when we get to heaven. And that takes me to the final point. And that is, because I care, I will look long term. You see, Jesus spoke about heaven all the time. This is only earth. Heaven is our eternal home. He says, when I return, says the Samaritan, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. He didn't, this wasn't a one-time help. He was committed to helping this man, and he was planning to come back to help him. You see, Jesus taught about what we sow, we reap, and that applies to kindness in a big, big way. If you are kind, the chances are people will be kind back to you. If you're miserable, the chances are people will be miserable back to you. But what you sow, you reap. And when you sow kindness, you will reap. Now, maybe the people you are kind to don't appreciate it, and you never see them again. But you're not doing it for them. You're doing it because God is watching. And you know what? God will give you a reward for it. You will reap, maybe from somebody else sometime later, but you will reap. It just takes time. It takes time. What you sow, you will reap. I, I have a big place in my heart for children. I've started my ministry teaching Sunday school and at 23, and I love reaching children for Christ. Some of the kids I reached for Christ way back then are still following Jesus today. And every church I've gone to, I've been involved in the Sunday school and the Sunday schools have grown because I love reaching children. Dio Moody's, the great evangelist, had a big event. And somebody asked him, well, what, what happened at the event? And he, Dio Moody said, well, two and a half people got saved. Two and a half people. What do you mean, two and a half? You mean two adults and a child? No, 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 said Dio Moody. I mean two children and an adult, because the adult has already wasted half their life. You know... We need to look long term. And I have a heart for children's ministry. If there's any place where we need to offer kindness, where we need to encourage, where we need to be there and help them come to know Christ, be an example of what a follower of Jesus is, it's for children. So what does that bring us down to, to the end? And the end is, there's no act of kindness, no matter how small, that ever goes unnoticed. Those little actions, even though you're only one person, even though you don't have it all together, I don't, but we can do something. We can make that difference. Maybe it's opening the door to somebody. Maybe it's helping somebody up. Maybe with COVID in our lonely, broken world, we need to phone people more than ever before and email them and WhatsApp them and, uh, and Skype them. We need to be in touch, encouraging all the time, the more, because otherwise we'd be like James Lee who killed himself because, because he didn't want to live in an impersonal world. And we need to be kind. 
And I hope that we will now, through technology, be kinder. We can send gifts through Amazon. We can do whatever it is that we need to do to make sure that people know that they're valued, that they're appreciated, and pray for them, especially pray for them, obviously so. I close with this. True story. This guy's name, little boy, was called Howard Kelly. And Howard Kelly was, this was quite a long time ago, couldn't, they couldn't afford to get him to school, uh, to, to college, I guess. And he wanted to go to college, but their parents didn't have any money. He didn't have any money. So he, he was living in a small town. And so he went door to door, knocking on doors, trying to sell products like cookies. And, 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 and nobody wanted to buy the cookies because it was a poor area and it was a difficult time economically. And so he, he, he went door to door and lunchtime was coming on this particular day and, and he was hungry. He hadn't had dinner last night and there was nothing to eat for breakfast this morning. And, and, but he was really wanting to get an education. And so he knocks on this door and, and as he knocks on the door, a, lady opened, a young lady opens the door and the young boy is standing there and he says, you know, would you like to buy these things? And, and he was going to ask her for, for something for lunch because he hadn't eaten. But he chickened out. He, he, he was too embarrassed. He said, could I have a glass of water? And the young lady who sees this young man and, and sees how skinny he looks and tired he looks and depressed he looks, she goes and prepares a sandwich for him and comes out with a little sandwich and a huge big glass of milk. Here. And the young man eats that wonderful sandwich, drinks a big glass of milk, and then says, how much do I owe you? He only had 10 cents in his pocket. How much do I owe you? And the young lady says, no, you don't owe us anything. Mother taught us we never charge for kindness. And he went on his way. What she didn't know is that he was going to quit. He was going to give up. It was too hard. But that glass of milk, that little act of kindness, and here's the whole point, of the sermon was enough to encourage him. And he did more houses and eventually got the money. Well, quite a few years later, that young lady has a, gets a disease, a serious disease. They rush her to the hospital. They don't know, the doctors don't know what's wrong with her and they can't find out. So they call a specialist. And the specialist was called Howard Kelly, Dr. Howard Kelly. And Dr. Howard Kelly came to be the consultant on this very complicated case. And when he sees the town that she's from, he remembers the town of the glass of milk. And so when he goes in to see her, he immediately recognizes it's the same lady that gave him the glass of milk. So he consults and gets all the medical attention. And eventually, because of him being a specialist, they manage to get her better. And he says to the the people in the business side of the hospital, when the bill comes, send it to me. I want to look at it first. And when he gets a bill, instead of giving it to her, he puts on the bill, paid in full, with a glass of milk. We don't know the impact of those acts of kindness. But we do know that that is how Jesus has called us to live. I want to be kinder than I have, especially in these days of COVID. I may only be one, but I have the power of kindness on my side, and I have God on my side. And Jesus wants to shine through you. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we pray to you. We thank you that the best example of kindness and love is you who came to earth as a savior to die on a cross, was buried and rose again. And I pray for those that are giving their life to Christ right now, right in their home or here in this auditorium. Jesus, we want to surrender our lives to you. We want to know your kindness for ourselves. We want to know your forgiveness. We want to know that we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And I pray for all of us that as we leave this building, let us be thankful for your kindness to us. Let us be thankful for the kindness many Christians have shown to us over the years. And now it is our turn to show kindness to our broken world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all.